Okay, today I'm going to review Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow by Yuval Noah Harari. So, this is, oh, sorry, this is the author that wrote Sapiens, which was his first book, and it, it went uh, insanely bit, or viral, I guess you would call it, I think it's sold millions and millions of copies almost 100 million i think it sold a ton though it's a very big book and this is his follow-up book and now this book is about the future um the first time i read this book was a few years ago and honestly i couldn't remember a single thing from the book i yeah i remember reading it i remember the experience of reading it but i don't remember any of the points that were made or any of the any segments or i, I completely forgot everything which is not a good sign I remembered Sapiens, and I read that before I read this book. So you, you can kind of tell that the, the lasting impacts of Sapiens was, was greater for me than what this book was. So that's not a, not a good place to start with a book if there's no lasting takeaways from the book. Uh, when I reread this book, I kind of was trying to figure out why I didn't remember. What, what was it in the book that made it so that I didn't retain anything from the book? And what I really dialed into was that the book really just meanders. Uh, it doesn't make any clear points, and it has a lot of flaws in the way it's written so that it sounds good, but there's no good, useful takeaways from the book. And really what he does is he makes these very generalized points about uh, people and our history, and then he makes these predictions that are so far out in the future, and they're so generalized that there, there's nothing you can really take away from it. They're so... I mean, they're just too general. They're, there's no like tangible things to take away. They're, they're very general points. And I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't remember anything. It's also, like I said, it meanders. And to give you an idea of how it meanders and how he kind of wastes pages, this book starts off with, um, he makes this point that our history is filled with plagues, famines, and wars. And, which, and that's a, just right off the bat, that's a very obvious thing. You don't have to give evidence or much evidence, like a couple paragraphs about the fact that there's been wars and plagues and famines in the past. I mean, I'm pretty sure that general knowledge, especially for an audience that is reading nonfiction books, I think that that's, a, that's something that you don't have to say. Like you don't have to convince someone that World War II happened. Uh, you can just start talking about it. And he spends like 19 pages really describing plagues in the past and wars in the past i mean it doesn't go into a ton of detail it's only 19 pages but that's like the first 19 pages of the book and then at the end when he's talking about each topic he he throws in a, a little like paragraph saying that there's less now and kind of implying that you know in the future there won't be plagues or there won't be famines but really the bulk of that that section is just talking about plagues that have happened in the past wars that have happened in the past and that was just completely useless to me because everyone that reads a book is already going to be on the same page with understanding that those did happen. And if the book's about the future, then to start off with just, you know, a bunch of filler about the past was really disappointing. And it, it doesn't seem like much, but that's 4.6% of the book. I did the calculation. The book's like 402 pages. There's like 18 and a half pages uh, on these topics. And that's like the first chunk of the book where you should grab an audience. And really, he's just talking about uh, things that everyone learned in grade school. So that's kind of just like a disappointing way to start the book. It, it really starts it off showing you that he doesn't really have solid points or, I mean, it was just, it wasn't a good start for me. And then when the book gets going, uh, you start to notice various things that I didn't like about the book. Uh, he seems to be pretty biased. He has this very rose-colored view of Marxism. So really, uh, and there's other things he says uh, that, that I'm, I'm pretty sure he's pretty far on the that side of the political spectrum. Uh, he does say a couple things about capitalists, but he really, he says some pretty biased things about Marxism. I don't want to get into too much detail. Uh, this is actually the second time I recorded the review because the first time I spent like 30 minutes just like railing on his mar the view that he had on uh, some things. And the video wasn't really that good. It wasn't very concise. So I'm re-recording it today. Uh, but yeah, the section of Marxism I thought was pretty biased. He also, he 
he seems to mix up causes and effects when he characterizes what happens in the past often he'll just talk about the effects but the way he states it it's almost as if he's implying that the effects of different things were the cause for instance he briefly talks about uh, how humans traded meaning for power and, and he's talking about when we gave up religion and moved towards science and really started finding answers for ourselves uh, that, that we got the power from science but we gave up the meaning we got from religion and well that you might be able to say that that happened or that that is uh that that's uh i think a, a valid way of characterizing certain uh, aspects of the recent past but that was never the cause and effect no person that was studying science sat down and said you know i'm going to give up meaning because i want power but the way the way he talks about it he implies that that was the 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 reason the transition happened but really it's just people trying to find things out and they discovered things and they were useful inventions and it just kind of snowballed from you know these little steps into this this big transition over time but you know no one sat down and really thought that they were giving up meaning for power but the way he writes it it almost implies that that's what happened and he does that a few times and it's kind of disappointing uh, at least for me because I don't ever I need cause and effect to retain or not not I don't need it to retain things but I will only put something in my mental model if I really can understand all the cause and effects and and w what was it about the causes that had the effects and you know you're really trying to kind of figure out the nuts and bolts of things if you want to understand it yourself and he doesn't provide any of that he has this this very like literary kind of novelist way of talking about the past where it sounds a lot like commentary. It's not very scientific in the writing. It's not technical in the writing. It's very just general and it sounds good, but um, there's there's nothing to really take away and you you won't really understand anything for yourself uh, from the book. And and when you do when he talks about things you do understand, a lot of times it's pretty disappointing. Uh, and I found that when he was talking about Marxism and really the economic impacts of market, Marxism because I do understand the economics pretty well. I know this all sounds pretty general, so I, uh, there's one argument he makes in here uh, that I want to kind of dive into for a second just to, to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. He makes this argument in the book, pretty early in the book, about the history of lawns. And the point of this argument is he's trying to show that there are things from the past that uh, are still present in modern society, but they're only here because we did it in the past, or there's some, you know, just quirks of the past and things happen to happen a certain way, and we're carrying the baggage of the past. And, and that's a pretty good type of argument because I think there are things like that within society. But the argument he makes is about lawns, just grass lawns, the type that you'd find in parks or in houses. And he goes on this tangent about how lawns started as these things that royalty had uh you know back in medieval times when there were just you know royals and and peasants and he talks about how only royalty could have the resources for a lawn because that land is not productive i mean it's good ground you could grow crops you could graze cattle but if you just have a pretty piece of grass and, and you keep it very manicured that's something that only rich people could have and really if if you're even if you were rich and your finances started to go, you couldn't maintain your lawn. So it was a very, it was a status thing. Uh, and then he talks about how it, it moved into uh, rich people in early industrial eras. They started putting lawns in their houses. They copied a lot of royalty. And then he talks about how that moved down to the middle class. Uh, in the U.S. especially, like all the houses have lawns. I mean, I live in the desert, so not everybody has a lawn here because it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, but we do have uh, some astroturf lawns, some backyards, things like that. But mo in most of the country, there's just lawns everywhere. And this part of the argument's not that bad. Tracing the history of lawns, that's, I think, pretty accurate. That is how they migrated. But then he goes on to say, and this is where the argument gets ridiculous, that you should just give up your lawn because it's just, uh, it's just uh, you know, a quirk of the past. There's no utility there. And you should do some... You should express your newfound freedom by choosing something new and interesting that uh, most people think would be weird. Uh, and his example is 
you should replace your lawn with a Japanese rock garden. That's kind of the last little point in the, the argument. That's his, his uh, suggestion. And I think that this whole argument here just shows how detached he is from the reality. And mainly because lawns are extremely useful. I mean, I spent my childhood on, on lawns. Every summer you're running around, you're playing. People play sports on lawns. And he talks about how we play sports on lawns, but he doesn't say why we do it. He thinks it's just because we did it because that's what we did in the past. But it's very useful. It's a very useful uh, environment for a lot of things because it's soft, it's fun, it grows back. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of useful uses for lawns. That's why they have them in parks because you run around, you play, you have barbecues. They're fun things. I mean, they're useful. You get utility out of lawns. And that's why I think they they existed from the past. Like they might have started off as a status symbol, but now they're uh, a very useful thing. And to, to say that we should swap those out for something like a Japanese rock garden, which is really just like an art installation. It's a, it's a, a garden to look at. But there's, there's not a lot of utility other than the aesthetic value. Uh, I think that just shows how detached he is from reality, how just how he does he doesn't understand what's going on with the modern society and, and with how people use lawns. But really, you can look further at the just the structure of the argument is very poor itself. The way you just say something was previously a status symbol, then over time it became more economical and other people are and just kind of the population in general started using this thing. Uh, and then it just became ubiquitous within society. That's the same thing that happened to things like indoor toilets, bathing, cleanliness, having art in your house, having you know a warm climate controlled house. Uh, all those things started as things that would have been status symbols for rich people, things that you could only have in castles and in very wealthy villas. But now they're kind of in everyone's homes. But none of those things could be characterized as just, you know, useless uh, status symbols that are just, you know, things that we, we have now because other people did it in the past. I mean, all those things survived to the modern day because they were so useful. I mean, there, there's a lot of utility in all these things. So to characterize lawns in, in that manner, uh, I thought it was just really poor. It was a bad argument. And it's he puts in like three or four pages of pictures within the book. Uh, maybe I'll pull that up. So I know this was like an important argument he was trying to make. It wasn't very long, but he follows it up with, uh, you know, this whole section of pictures. And I'll show you here. So he says right here. I don't know if you can see that, but it says a brief history of lawns. And then there's a couple pages. And then, you know, he has a few pages of pictures of lawns. Like it's just, or I guess it's just these two pages right here. But I mean, he gives up a couple pages uh, to put pictures of the lawns because it is an argument that he, he put some importance on in the book. And, you know, it almost made me mad because the, within the whole argument, he never talks about how useful lawns are or any utility that people might get. And to make an argument for why lawns are ubiquitous in society today without taking into account the utility that people get out of a lawn is just, I mean, that's so detached from the reality of why lawns exist today. I mean, there's all kinds of things from the past that didn't survive that were status symbols. I mean, in America, all the, the, the founding fathers, they used to wear these ridiculous white wigs. I mean, that didn't survive. People dropped that as soon as they could because it was dumb and there was no utility in it, but people still have all these other uh, aspects of the past that were only in rich, uh, wealthy parts of society. But we have them now because they're useful. They had utility. And I mean, nobody wants to give up their indoor plumbing or having art in their walls or being able to eat enough. I mean, leisure time, being able to read, being able to better yourself because you have free time. Those were all things that no one else could do but rich people in the past. But now everyone does it. And it's it's not because we're just trying to impress each other. It's because they were useful things to do or useful things to have. So, I mean, that's just an example of, of what I thought was a really poor argument that he puts some emphasis on in the book. And it, it's, it's the, I can't, I can't believe it made it through the editing process. I mean, it's very detached. He, 
tries to say that all lawns are just these aesthetic things. And I mean, it, it was pretty bad for me, at least. Maybe I'm biased because of my my history growing up in America. You lawns are everywhere. So maybe uh, I have a little bit different uh, of a perspective on the issue. But I thought that was, that was just an example that really stood out to me of how poor some of his arguments can be. Um, so I really, I mean, I don't think I would ever recommend this book to anyone. I was pretty disappointed with it, uh, honestly. I know it's a popular book. People have pretty high opinions of it, but I I really, I don't think it's that good. I think the subtitle of the book gives away why the book didn't succeed. It's a brief history of tomorrow. History can be brief, or the narratives we create in history, especially ancient history, they can be brief, but they can be brief because we don't have that much information about the, the ancient past. So we take the facts we have, and then we create kind of simplistic narratives. But we know it was more complex. There was more nuance. There's a lot more going on. But we simplify it because we don't know. Uh, we don't know that much. We only know the, a few details. And then as you get towards recent history, we have a lot of complexity. We have a lot of nuance. And if you talk about the future, the useful way to talk about the future is to take all these details from the recent past and and what's going on presently. And you kind of roll the, the clock forward and you show where things are going in the near future. You talk about challenges that people will face, opportunities. Uh, you talk about, you know, critical aspects of where things will go in the future. And then maybe you project a little bit farther forward in speculation. And that's kind of how most books about the future uh, are written. You know, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of talking about things that are, are coming shortly, things that are coming uh, farther along, but it's really you're using a lot of details from the recent past to talk about the future. And when you speculate about the distant future, it's at the very end when you kind of all the the details you have about the the current trends uh, run out. Uh, but but what uh, Noah Harari does in this book, I don't know how to, he has three names. I can't. I don't. It's weird. I don't know if he goes by Yuval or so. I don't know how to refer to him. But the author. He kind of just talks about these general trends in the past and then he jumps forward to the to the far future. And if he does talk about the present, it's very generalized. And so you never get any details. And so the most useful part of books about the future are usually the parts that are in the near future or a little bit or it'll be 10 or 20 years out. Things where details really matter. And that's whole this whole part of the future is just skipped or just has gone over so briefly. And so generally that there's no utility there. The narrative he creates about the future is the same way. It's the same type of narrative he creates about the ancient past. And it's not really a useful narrative if you want to know things about the near future. Uh, and the things on the far future, they're so generalized. I mean, the whole thing is pretty useless to me. I mean, there's nothing to latch on to. Um, I mean, it's kind of it's so generalized that you're like, why? You could have just summarize this a lot quicker. At least that's how I felt on the book. So I hope that wasn't too meandering or or uh, long-winded. But yeah, I, I really, I didn't like the book that much. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I was pretty disappointed with it. And I think people that like this book don't read a lot of other books or they just want to impress their friends. It's a cool looking book. He talks about some high-minded subjects uh, like morality and, and where people get meaning from and how science might erode meaning in the future. And those, those might be cool things to talk about, um, at dinner parties or something, but there's not a lot, there's no meat to the book. There's no details. There's no, there's no, you know, logical arguments that build to anything. It's, it's very just these kind of biased, uh, generalized narratives about, where things are going in society. And, you know, I, re I really didn't like the book that much. Uh, so I hope you like this review. I hope you like the video. Uh, sorry if you liked the book and you were kind of looking at reviews to get some positive feedback or positive reinforcement for your own views. But yeah, I kind of, I think I maybe go against the grain here, but I really, I did not enjoy this book. I didn't remember anything from the book. And uh, I'm sure if you talk to me, and six months or a year from now, I'm not going to remember anything about the book then, even though I've read it twice now. So, uh, again, hope you liked the video. Uh, stick around. I've got some more reviews coming. I've got a bunch of books to review pretty soon. Uh, I just bought some. Uh, some of the books were recommended to me. 
Uh, so if you do have any books that you want to see me review, please put a comment in the, or put the title in the comments below and I'll get to it in the future. And I also, I promise I will have a real studio at some point in the future, uh, maybe in a few weeks, uh, maybe a couple more reviews in my temporary studio here. Uh, so thanks, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.